Sorry, I was late. Oh, wow, that's sort of big. I'm sorry, I was late. I was even held up by the cops, and they gave me a fine. So it's good somebody else could take over. Uh, there goes my fee, <laughs> uh, and a bit of extra, I think. But anyway, I got here. I'm still like a little bit unprepared, but you know, I can open up stuff as we go along, and and I have to improvise a bit. So bear with me. I don't know who actually have. I don't know how many people have actually walked with me through the YouTube Protec. It's something, when I give a talk, I very often do it by means of this YouTube Protec, which is a collection of, of videos and clips and, and uh, uh, things that, you know, it's a project that's been going on for at least like 15 years where we've very often where I make alliances with other curators or people who are in the field or who critics or who are involved with media criticism and that we make sort of a, a collaboration to collect or curate a couple of clips that plug into a certain theme. So I don't know how many people know if I should give a little bit of an introduction or if I should just plug in immediately to some... I can give a little introduction and then take it from there and jump to something more contemporary, stuff that I've been dealing with uh, recently. Um, and I was thinking... Uh, Maybe not a lot of people have seen Double Take, which is the, the, the recent film that I've, that's just going to come out. It's going to premiere tomorrow in, Rotter in Amsterdam at the ITFA. It's been shown here, but not actually a lot. So maybe I can show a little bit of clips or fragments from Double Take, the new film. And then, uh, because the video library is very often a way to actually elaborate themes and to come to new projects. Like, it takes quite some time to develop some themes and make a new film. And sort of the intermediary period is very often a way of collecting stuff. And then even sometimes when, I, when I'm invited to curate in something anyhow, I take the YouTube tech or when I teach, I, I, I do it by means of this. But um, sort of an early project uh, that was a condensation of the early video library. At the, at the beginning, it was a VHS video. I don't know if, if is the sound good? Yes, a good. Hello. <laughs> uh, uh, I lost my thread there. Yeah, uh, the video library was sort of uh, first installed 1995 and then 90, uh, 1997 at uh, Documenta, where it was mainly VHS tapes. So it was, you know, installed with a seed, with a coffee, and a remote control. So you could fast forward and rewind. And at that time, it was sort of an interesting concept and it sort of like was a way of delving through the material that was developed in Dal history because a lot of stuff that Dal history deal with is the shift from the 70s to the 80s, but also the shift from uh, film. And when journalists went into the field with the Bolex camera, they now went into the field with the, with the small camera because the video camera had gotten so small that actually it made that transition possible. But also, when I was looking for footage for Dial History, most of the footage before 1980 was sort of 60 millimeter film, even at ABC News, although it's now slowly, slowly been uh, converted to digital, I believe. And then from 1980 was sort of on videotape that I had to rewind or fast forward if I wanted to see as much footage as, as I could from, uh, it was a couple of days that we were actually at ABC News looking for footage for Dial History. So we were fast forwarding a lot. And now the idea of fast forwarding and zapping became for me sort of a tool to point, to point at the 80s. You know, Walter Benjamin would sort of, and I very often refer to that, Walter Benjamin would sort of take montage as a way of a, criti of, of a social analysis, you know, or Baudelaire, um, Baudelaire when he was talking about the flaneur. You know, in the 80s we would rather talk about zapping, which is sort of very different, but now towards the 90s we would call it z skipping. So he would sort of, from instead, sort of from DVD technology where you skip and you still sort of go fast forward in a digital way. Now we skip and we just jump chapters and, and so it's sort of completely digital. And so um, why I wanted to like touch upon Double Take is because there in that film, it's about a Hitchcock double, but it deals a lot about the YouTube rev uh, generation and a lot about uh, sort of that digital revolution, if you might call it a revolution. Uh, but it is a lot of how we actually again have to sort of adjust and relate to a world of images and reality as such as well through an acceleration of images and, and 
that was already was very prevalent in dial history where sort of by the 1980s so images accelerated uh, because of certain reasons one it was the beginning of cable so we also have the beginning of CNN and MTV and I think for me that's crucial because they start styling styling off to one another the aesthetic codes are sort of interchanged but not only that sort of the news becomes around the clock it's sort of it's 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 not 24 hours and because they wanted to make zap proof news it's sort of you zap away and you can drop in they call it the drop in style you can always come back to CNN and you haven't missed anything because it keeps going and Patricia Malenkam calls it sort of that obsessive behavior she anal analyzes it in sort of Freudian terms where it becomes sort of an obsession but I'll come to that I'll come back to that and showing some examples of of, of you know how, how we could analyze all of that um, I'm sort of zapping myself a little bit between all the different teams. But sort of the very early condensation of that video library was sort of a project about the history of the remote control. The remote control and also the history of zapping, but zapping in relation to the commercial break because they're inevitably linked. Um, because, you know, we only start zapping because there's enough stations, there's cables, so there's many more stations. It's 24 hours. Uh, also, the VCR was sort of became its entry also in the 80s, and even so, by the mid 80s, zapping was so prevalent that the advertising industry were calling for zap-proof commercials. They were freak they were freaking out that people were zapping away. So whenever people take control, because zapping is sort of a way of also taking control, the viewer takes control. Although I would sort of maybe question that as well, because you zap only what's available. You don't zap what is not represented. So it's 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 sort of a bit tricky because when you deal about representation, you immediately also deal about what's not being represented. But anyway, you know, the advertising didn't like advertising industry didn't like that people were taking control and they would they still wanted to because it also depends on geographical boundaries. Maybe in the United States was very different, but their sort of a mass audience is sold in numbers as ads, and they are actually sponsoring the programs. So now, when they were zapping away from commercials, it was sort of not appreciated. So there was the call for zap-proof commercials, and you see by the mid-80s that the aesthetically, or the way the, 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 the spot, the commercial spot is set up, is sort of adapting itself. And it's again the advertising industry trying to grab control and trying to push you at, at looking at certain stuff. Again, with the DV, like sort of, for example, by the, by the end of the 90s, you had sort of the DVIs. The, the digital video recorders, the DVRs, that actually also are advertised where you could skip away from commercials. And again, there was a whole like sort of a couple of corporations that wanted to sue TiVo, for example, that sort of announced that you could actually skip away from commercials. And again, there was a court case where advertising agencies were trying to, get, to grab control. Anyway, to come back to this project, maybe I'm talking too much. But uh, an early condensation was sort of that you could, in this, it's sort of um, a website project where you could actually chronologically go through different sort of aphorism and little quotes about, uh, that relate to the history of, of, of zapping. But you can also zap through keywords. So it sort of envelops that idea of zapping in itself, the way it's constructed, the, the website itself. But I, I wanted to sort of show some early clips that were already in the video library from the very beginning. And one is, for example, because I'd like to talk a little bit about commercials as well. Uh, maybe it's not loud enough. So here is an early commercial from the 70s. And you see, because I believe also in, in displacement through time, his commercials can come to stand as a sort of a bit of a documentary, as, a, as it has documentary value because it still portrays what was going on in that time. And I want to also talk about masquerading and how certain genres can sort of stand for one another. Exactly how CNN also can sort of adapt MTV and MTV can adapt sort of political footage, how actually they mimic one another and masquerade as one another. And here is a commercial who masquerades as a film trailer and sort of takes on that idea of fiction, but at the same time refers to the Cold War arena where we're sort of like it, it sort of is supported also of East and West. It's maybe a little bit small, but...
So that's sort of a clear example. But I, through that, I want to maybe talk a little bit about uh, how Double Take came about. So let's show two little things. So Double Take is very much, it's, 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 it started with a Hitchcock casting. I was looking for a Hitchcock double. And I want to talk about the idea of lookalike, lookalike politics, lookalike reality. But through Double Take, all these themes are sort of analyzed through, through sort of a dialogue of, that Hitchcock has with Hitchcock. And it's with a Hitchcock double. And in, uh, in London, during the Hitchcock casting, we, we, we stumbled onto somebody who's been playing Hitchcock for 20 years. And it was sort of strange because a lot of coincidences fell into place when I started talking to him because he was born on the same day as Hitchcock. He sort of worked at the same places that Hitchcock used to frequent. For example, he worked as a lift boy at the Claridge's Hotel where Hitchcock used to stay. Or he afterwards went to work for the Savoy uh, restaurant where, where Hitchcock actually used to dine very frequently. It was Hitchcock's favorite restaurant, but also Ron Burridge, the Hitchcock double, would serve people like Cary Grant, James Mason, also Laura and Hardy, but also it's precisely those actors that Hitchcock used to work with. And I thought, wow, that's sort of interesting how, you know, maybe we could sort of do something with that and try to explore those themes. Now, this is just a setup. And, um, So this is the Hitchcock double. I, I won't show too much, but the whole film is built up, up around the lookalike. But also, I, I wanted to include, because I set the, the, the sort of the film around the time of the 1960s. It's the beginning uh, of a, a period where a lot of tele, uh, cinemas are closing down and television is on the rise. And it's sort of a moment where Hollywood had to redefine itself, but also where, where Hitchcock was already performing on his one-minute sketches in Alfred Hitchcock Presents for five, six, seven years. And for me, it was sort of crucial to analyze that because not only, you know, in cinema studies, a lot of things have been written about, you know, uh, uh, the prof proliferation of Hitchcock and the history of cinema, but very often they don't like refer to his, cinema, to his television work. And he didn't direct a lot of Alfred Hitchcock Presents, but what was sort of for me uh, uh, interesting was that he sort of introduced 370 of those series while laughing with the commercial. And I thought, wow, that's sort of interesting. And very often he plays also on the idea of the double. And for me, it was also like television as a double of cinema and to analyze how, you know, how that came about, how, how again, television as a lookalike of cinema and on and on and on. And then bury me a little bit. I want to like get to YouTube where sort of YouTube becomes sort of lookalike of television and, and on and on and on. But it's sort of crucial to, to, to plug into the themes of, of double take. But let me show you one example of how, how, how Hitchcock used to laugh with, uh, with the commercial. Maybe we could put it a little louder. There is, of course, also in the film an analysis between satellite technology, rockets, the Cold War, uh, nuclear rockets, and the advent of television, and sort of the fear that is propagated as a spectacle together with the space race that was played out through television is sort of very prevalent in the film as well. So. Thank you. 
So I took a little bit of a longer uh, section to, to, to show also that, that different themes are explored in, in, dial, in dial history, in double take, sorry, in double take. And it's sort of, you have always those two guys, it's not only Hitchcock and Hitchcock, it's also Khrushchev and Nixon, who are having this conversation, it's two guys talking about their rockets or talking about film and cinema and television. And then you have the, the women in the kitchen doesn't know how to make coffee and it's sort of like how how they become mirrors of one another. And um, maybe it's too much to dig into that, but the fact that it's a coffee commercial is sort of interesting because I specifically chose uh, for the coffee commercial, but only, you know, let me look if I can. Yeah, I hope, yeah, I found it. Um, what I always wanted to do was actually make a film where the film is interrupted by five commercial breaks because I, I don't know, I, it was sort of stylistically I wanted to do something with that. But now, when I was researching the themes for Double Take, I read an article by Restivo and he calls it The Silence of the Birds. And he, he sort of asked the question, why is nobody turning on the television set in the birds? Because you have the television furniture, it was sort of Warner Brothers actually, the beginning of the advent of television, they were trying to hide it away. It was not a welcome sort of piece of furniture because it was the competition. It was competition between New York and, and Los Angeles and, for example, Lucy Ball, who made the first transition as an actress to, to New York. But sort of the television furniture was not welcome at all. And it, there's something similar happening here with, with the birds that you hear the radio and, you know, the radio announces the catastrophe of birds attacking the village. But nobody turns on the television set, but although it's on on screen and he says maybe it's because the birds are television it's the catastrophe culture descending onto the home trapping the people in front of the television trapping the people as a birds in the house but he goes a step further as well he also analyzes how actually the move to suburbia and in the birds the film the birds you see melanie the protagonist actually moving from san francisco to bodega bay uh, it's sort of a, a metaphor for the move to suburbia and the move to suburbia, the beginning of the sex is, is, is the supermarket, is the car. It's sort of a whole new way of how 
how societies define and he says that was possible thanks to television because television is still able to grab control ideologically of that move to suburbia and sort of he goes he goes sort of very far in that trajectory. I don't know if, you know, the birds have been analyzed in very different ways. It's also been analyzed in sort of a Freudian way where sort of the birds become libidinized as sort of the, the repressed sexuality of Melanie coming back to haunt the family house. But here is very clearly a political analysis. And then I was sort of researching and, and he goes on about that as well, that actually how the coffee houses in Russia were so prevalent for sort of instigating also the revolution, sort of the coffee, the, the, the sort of the coffee break. And he goes on to say that you see in the birds that Melanie and the mom of, 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 of the guy she's going to look visit for uh, Rod Taylor in, in Bodega Bay, is that they always have this tea ritual, a coffee ritual, and always when the birds attack, they actually attack the, the, the cups of coffee. And it's maybe because, you know, it's the coffee break has replaced is, is being replaced by the commercial break. But that's sort of my, my trajectory. And I wanted to point at that because it does so that Hitchcock was so upset, and that's also, also, also a little bit the dialogue that is happening between Hitchcock and Hitchcock, is, is about that commercial break and how television has maybe, I don't know if I would agree with that, but that, you know, because they existed both at the same time, but they did affect one another. Um, so, uh, anyway, I wanted to show all these Folgers commercials because I actually wrote to Folgers because I love to have actually real commercials in the film. And you see from the 60s to the 80s how they actually also very much change. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that as well. So, um, uh, but how should I, how should I frame it? This. Let me go back to a discussion that, uh, that Thomas Elsesser points at. Uh, to Thomas Elsesser wrote a little essay about I'm not Hitchcock and about how actually Hitchcock has been cloned in so many ways and there's such a proliferation of Hitchcock and cinema studies that actually you could say that a Nietzschean Hitchcock or a Heidegger in Hitchcock and Foucault in Hitchcock are all sitting around the table having a discussion. And that sort of Hitchcock has become a clone. There is, there is none other director that you go to a video store or, or you, you look for the DVDs of Hitchcock. There's none other director that's so much present that's so much present in, in DVD libraries as well. But it's the same in cinema studies, or, or you watch The Simpsons and there is sort of Hitchcock making a cameo. There is such an omnipresence of, of that Hitchcock language, and, and I want to come back to that because it's sort of how cinema and then television and YouTube borrows from all these other sort of mediums. And here, uh, and that's what Thomas Elser points at, it's sort of what he calls the ontological shift. It's sort of that those images are so out there that sort of we start styling reality after fiction. And sort of when 9-11 happened, he says, when 9-11, and Zizek actually wrote about it as well, how actually the birds are sort of, sort of definitely the, the, when the plane, uh, when the bird attacks Melanie when she crosses Bodega Bay, how that looked like the second plane that attacked the, the second World Trade Center tower. But also how when we watched those images on television, there was so much reminiscence of fiction films and that image of the towers collapsing, towering inferno, the matrix and go on and on and on was already so much there that you, you almost dare say that Hollywood was running ahead of reality. And here, what I wanted to show now is, it's The Lone Gunman. It's a series that was aired on American television six months before 9-11 happened and it exactly sort of portrays even in a more sort of maybe more sardonic or, or sarcastic way how it also also points at conspiracy uh, reality or theory. So let me show a clip of that. We should. Thank you. 
you find a dozen tin pot dick diggers all over the world just clamoring to take responsibility. So literally he says, you know, we have to attack a building in the middle of New York City and then we can blame it on a dictator because we have to sell our arms. And so look what happens later on. It's sort of like, it, it, it sort of portrays exactly what was happening during 9-11. The funny thing is that the plane, also, the plane also took off in Boston, but this was aired on March 2001, and nobody in the media, mainstream media in the United States, dared to talk about this film. It was only aired once, and it was aired in Canada 10 September 2001. So nobody talks about that. But I take on this example to actually point at the fact that reality has, to come, has become to look as a look-alike reality, and politics have become look-alike politics. You know, when one talks about weapons of mass destruction, there's a look-alike of weapons of mass destruction and it becomes a reality in Iraq. And so I wanted to point a little bit about all that, yeah. I wanted to end actually with the swine flu, but uh, I don't know if you'll have time, but. Ah, you have time? This is one little YouTube clip. This is one little YouTube clip. Uh, sorry, what was moving? All oh, right. Well, uh, there's an attack on on its way. <laughs>
weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Of mass destruction. The smoking gun. Weapons of mass destruction. You can use them. Weapons of mass destruction. Terrorists. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Biological. Weapons of mass destruction. Terrorists. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Terrorists. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. If you have a nuclear weapon, chemical, biological, weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. So weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Acts of terrorism. Weapons of mass destruction. 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 Weapons of mass terror. And weapons of mass destruction. Terrorist acts. Terrorist weapons of mass destruction. Nuclear weapons. Weapons of mass destruction. Violence. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Terrorist threats. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Biological weapons. Weapons of mass destruction. Chemical. They have weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass terror. Weapons of mass terror. Weapons of mass destruction. Massive death. Weapons of mass destruction. Terrorism. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. It's not weapons of mass destruction. 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 Terrorism. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Mushroom cloud. Weapons of mass destruction. 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 So there's a little clip by uh, Robert Arnold. Um, but I wanted to show this one to what I already pointed out, what Matt Patricia Mellencamp calls the obsession in the media. And I would argue actually that it has become the new contemporary sublime. It's sort of an icon that doesn't ask any questioning. By mere repetition, it becomes a reality. And, you know, even in the Kantian sense of like what Kant sort of described as nature and the fear that it instills in us, and then taken on by Edmund Burke's discussion about how fear, how, how sort of the guillotine became that subliminal image of, of fear is sort of 9-11 and those weapons of mass destruction are our, our new contemporary sublimes, including the swine flu. But let me weave a little bit the itinerary uh, to go back to double take and a couple of other things um, and to come back to the commercial as well. That's the same what the commercial does. It's sort of that repetition that is sort of drills us into what reality is supposed to be. Um, and let me go back to Hitchcock sort of Maybe this is sort of a funny commercial, but it shows how actually things are taken over and then start masquerading for something else and start to mean for something else. Five minutes done. Okay, I have to be very quick then. Uh, there's so many uh, different stuff that I still wanted to show, but let me let me jump to Rumsfeld because I thought that was sort of interesting. How how um, and it's actually the trailer, but it's this is actually part of Double Take. It's sort of a part of Double Take as well. Maybe it's a little bit too loud. Uh, it's sort of Zizek 
actually argues that there is a fourth sort of category. Rumsfeld says there's the known known, there's the, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. But Zizek says there's also the unknown known. And by meaning that, uh, he says sort of things that are so blatantly out there, like weapons of mass destruction, but nobody dares to question it. The whole Iraq war is sort of an unknown known, but nobody dares to question it. And, you know, you, you, that's what you could sort of call paradigm blindness. It's sort of the reality becomes like a lookaright reality. Everybody starts believing in this bullshit, but it's just not really true, whatever that might mean. Um, I don't know, there's so many different teams I'd like to plug into, but we have to close it off, right? So maybe I'll show one more clip, and then... Uh, it's, re it's in reference to the birds as well. Oh, maybe we should have more sound. This is a commercial for a worldwide life fund, but disguised as sort of sort of news clip, but then in reference to a fiction film, The Birds, and it sort of masquerades with all the different elements and styles to actually be a commercial. So I, that's sort of a trajectory I, I sort of really like. But now, instead of... Uh, I also want to show some actually some strategies how you actually could use the same sort of masquerading game to counter precisely what's going on in the media. And let me show one example uh, by the... Chicken, I'm sorry. All right, it's by the Yes Man. And they sort of, it's one of the Yes Men guys himself who masquerades as one of, uh, uh, a member of Dow Jones to actually claim, in a fake way, to claim the legacy of Bhopal disaster and to actually prick at the point and be very critical about Dow Jones. And he's appearing on actually from Paris on BBC uh, mainstream. So I'm, I'm going to jump quickly because there's not much time, but I'm going to show at how at the end he's being denounced by, uh, so. Just to uh, reiterate what Chief Minister Sarah, the spokesman for Dan Chemicals, has just said. He says that Dan Chemicals now fully accept responsibility for the events in the world 20 years ago, and they want to cooperate in future elections. The industrial accidents have been... So he later at the day, they denounce and say, the guy who was the spokesman for Dow, Chemi uh, Dow Jones uh, Chemicals was actually a fake. And they denounce the whole, like, sort of, the fact that Dow Jones has taken up responsibility for all the victims of the Bhopal disaster. We're in India today. There's probably 900 GMT and 10 GMT. Maybe he's working around an interview with someone reporting to me from the Dow Chemical Company about Bhopal. This interview was inaccurate and part of a deception. All right. Um, maybe I'll end with one. Let's let's end with one more clip, and then we have a Q and A. Yeah. All right. So. 
Oh, sorry. I close it. <laughs> sorry. Uh, let me take. I, I wanted to show actually an Amnesty International clip where they actually joke about Shop TV. But maybe I can sort of show and end with Ali G, where he actually sort of takes on also this double thing of, of making confusion, but masquerading as sort of, uh, and at the same time, trying to get the message out there. So James Baker is the Secretary of State of Reagan at the time. It's a big question. It's sort of like where you want to go. I, I always, for me, I believe, for me, it's important to have a critical practice as well. So to, to take a step back and while being in mainstream media itself sometimes, not always, but sort of always sometimes explore the boundaries, but always trying to prick through sort of that reality paradigm that exists, which is a blatant lie sometimes, and to try through, sometimes humor is a good way because it becomes ironical and it's like what Baudelaire, Baudelaire used to talk about dédoublement, where the one who falls is making a joke about the fact he's falling and sort of when you're able to do that while you're in mainstream media and then you still have a critical eye on it, that's maybe a good strategy but you know there's so many different ways and I think you know it's not only through mediums because you know I don't know, I think reality as such is not a given. I think even reality should be questioned. And, you know, 
like your question is already so valid. I think to have a Q&A and a dialogue is already so crucial. And for me, that's as much a way to prick to all that stuff and that bullshit uh, as much as any other medium. Now, this strategy is, is a YouTube attack, and we make a, a selection. People can become their own curator, but at the same time, we made sort of a selection that also points at a different sort of way of how you could deal with mainstream media. And uh, a film is a way to do that. I think, you know, the, the, the sort of a little bit of VJing that I've done today is, is as much part of it as anything else. So it's, it's, there's many, many ways we could zoom in and be very specific about strategies, but questioning is crucial, I think. Questioning is crucial that know that, you know, don't fall asleep and uh, don't believe the bullshit like the swine flu. I don't know. It's, because I actually wanted to show this clip because in, in, I, I don't know if a lot of people... What? Yeah? Because in 1976, exactly what is happening now already happened. You know, they, they, they propagated the whole sort of swine flu bullshit and, and made people take... They called it a pandemic and it was not. And they made so many people take the, the swine flu. But there's still 400 cases running against the, the United States government of people that sue the government because they got paralyzed or even got killed. And only one person got really killed from the swine flu in 1976, and uh, that was a soldier. And then it's, it's close to Fort Dick, and you start thinking, well, maybe he was all like biogenetically bio engineered. So there's big questions there. So should I show it then? <laughs> I'm willing to take questions too, but... And this is a, a, a program, 60 Minutes, that is, is aired on the CBS. It was only aired once, but it was very critical at the time of what was going on. And you will, see, you will see a commercial, a swine flu vaccine commercial as well. Although. Maybe it leads, but anyway, the same bullshit is still in the swine flu shot today. The mercury is still part of it, and you can get neurological damage. Anyway, that's being part of being critical, but I don't know. Maybe there's more questions. <laughs> Thank you. 
yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, it's the way you tell a story. It's very different if you give a talk and you, you, you just glue some YouTube clips uh, in sort of a little dialogue. It's very different than a film. Uh, it's, it's, uh, but I would say double take, even dial history, because stylistically double take and dial history are very close, but there is sort of a, a stronger fiction narrative and a dialogue. And I believe that with a film, because I think that's also an important discussion within YouTube, you know, it's, it's all about download time these days. Clips are no longer than 10 minutes, and it's a time factor that is sort of crucial. And I think people don't take time anymore. It's, it was the same with the video library. When it was installed at Documenta, you get a cup of coffee and people go look at art in a very different way. They, they arrest and they take a seat, and it's sort of a convivial moment is created and it becomes different. And that's why also the guides took you know, took the people to Documenta 97 from Catherine David, they always ended up in the video library and they could stay as long as they want because it's, it demands a different act of watching. But, and the time factor is very different, is very important there. But for double take, I think that time factor is the fact that you tell a story in 80 minutes time was for me a challenge to, to, to take on. And the fact that it's shown in the cinema, but it's also shown on television, and it's, 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 it's shown in, in, on a DVD of people watching on a laptop, it doesn't matter. Of course, the reception is sort of perceived in a very different way, also across geographical boundaries. But still, you know, for me, it was interesting to take on that genre. And uh, also, the whole film is set up as a very hybrid sort of genre. It's not fiction. It's not documentary, but it's both. It's a very hybrid genre. It also has five commercial breaks because it says as much about the commercial. But the commercial double take has sort of, through time, it sort of changes. First you have sort of a commercial that's funny. Then the other one is even more severe towards the woman. The third one that you've seen is more sort of hard hitting. The fourth one talks about murder and the fifth one the sound is replaced by the psyche music and it becomes a murder. Maybe I shouldn't tell the plot of the film, but it becomes the murder weapon. And the commercial is being reinscribed in the story of the film as sort of a way to kill someone. And it's sort of playing with that genre, but you can only do that also through time, how it sort of builds up. And that suspense is sort of crucial. And I'd say, I don't know, it's, it, I think time is an important element that, uh, that you don't have on YouTube. Maybe we get a broad attention span. A broad attention span. It means you can pick from many different things and you zap around. It's a very different way of approaching reality and images of death or, or, or whatever images. But the attention span is very short and it's sort of, it's a different way. I, it's not, I don't say that's bad or wrong. I just notice it that sometimes you need a different format to tell something. There was one more question. Okay, just uh, something about the internet. Uh, could you just have a perspective on this event? It was, first of all, uh, before the Ives of Cosmic said it was the half minute of the time. It's a bar. And a lot of people were shocked by this. I'm not sure if they were amateurs. Who, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think so. But did you know also there is a, a, a look-alike of that event because that same morning at 10 o'clock, Cheney was holding an exercise, four exercises, and three of those exercises were flying to a high-rise in New York. That's why the army was not ready. And I'm not sure if they are amateurs. But anyway, I specifically refer to the new contemporary sublime because I didn't want to aestheticize it. Aesthetics is part of it because it's sort of an icon, but an icon also has a political message, just as, you know, Rumsfeld's quote has become an icon. And an icon 
precisely referring to the contemporary sublime is because those icons are not questioned. The mediation is sort of lost. It's, it's as is it's hard hitting. And it's the same what happens with television in, in the beginning of the 90s. You know, the reporter used to come back from the Vietnam War and there was sort of, uh, reporting had a time lapse, but when you mount a sort of a rocket on, on, on top of a rocket, the television, and it goes directly into the war and you get a glitch, we talked about glitches before, and I would be hesitant to aestheticize the idea of glitches because at the same time you have a glitch there of a rocket, but at the same time people are being killed. And nobody questions that because it has become an icon. It has an icon of smart technology and, and, and as such. And I believe 9-11 is the same. Has anybody asked why the hijackers did it? The whole discussion, and that's the trajectory in Dal history, is that the whole dialogue, because maybe a terrorist is, is wanting to say something, but even that is naive, because it's so much more exacerbated, that game, because terrorism has been reinscribed in the political agenda as merely an accommodation, as a fig leaf to hide the big shit underneath, and it has become a tool, and maybe 9-11 was just a tool to start a war. And I think that's what 9-11 is, for a big chunk. But then it's nothing if you compare it to weapons of mass destruction, because nobody, how, how, how many people know approximately how many people died in Iraq? It's hardly been discussed. They always talk about the soldiers coming back, but there's more than half a million. You know, I think there's maybe 10,000 more people killed by Bush's administration and actually by Saddam Hussein. And I think that exceeds 9-11 even. And also that is an icon, the weapons of mass destruction. And that's the new contemporary sublime, and it instills fear, and it's the swine flu, it instills fear. And they wanna, they wanna like make you fucking afraid because they can control you. And that's what it's all about. And they're not amateurs. And we shouldn't be amateurs either. I think we should be, you know, think about it and dialogue about it and be critical about it. I don't know if that's an answer, but. One more question. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to step there because I don't hear it. Um, well, it's maybe more than one question. According to the fact that I agree with the content of what you said, and yeah, you didn't put it to me, you didn't put it to me, but you 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 put it to me, I don't know if I can follow the three steps. Uh, uh, but first of all, about the fiction, I wouldn't necessarily describe it as, as negative. I, that's not what I was trying to do. I was trying to point out at the paradigm shifts that are happening. And maybe there's on a level of scale and opacity and transparency because the opacity has gotten, uh, you know, like for example, YouTube. You know, of course, there's more access. I, the fact that I can show the swine food, the fact that you can play the devil's advocate, that's good. 
Because the polemic, it's, it's exactly what I'm pointing out, and that's also what I'd like to do, is pointing out the fact that, you know, let's read it contradictory. Even Dal History was based on, the, on, on a book, but it claims the death of the novel and the death of the terrorist, but at the same time it was making use of that strategy of, of, of detournage. And it's, it's sort of, I think it's very contradictory. And, and um, I don't know, it, 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 it's sort of, what you point at is at the crux of what I'm trying to analyze. And I'm always baffled with the fact that, you know, sometimes, and that's what you, it's a two-edged sword. So you could find those weapons of mass destruction and things about the swine flu, and you can, you can have this whole like sort of critical analysis, but sometimes you get swamped. It's a two-edged sword because at the same time, there's so much more disinformation as well. And purposely, you know, when I read an article in New York Times, and then you always have to take it with a grain of salt, but you know, there were eight fake reporters every time, or more or less, when Bush had a had sort of a, a, a press conference, and they were spinning and they were disseminating articles that were totally fake. They used fake reporters and fake agencies and fake corporations. I, I don't have the article here with me, but it's sort of at the same time. Okay, you have more access, but there's so much more disinformation at the same time, and. It's, it's, uh, I think it's a tough one. I think it's a tough one. And it's good that we play each other's devil's advocate because it's so necessary to question that. And then um, my idea about fiction, I recently have, I've started like digging into quantum theory and quantum physics. And you know, the way matter is defined these days is that it's still a mystery and that you cannot separate the observer from the observed. And reality, that's what I said before, reality is not a given and fiction is not a given. It's, it's co-constructed. And I don't believe in objectifying and objectifying because that split between subject and object, that is so much part of that enlightenment and, and rationalism, has made also that that object is being so rationalized and exploited that actually we have to have a new shift of paradigm and there's sort of call for a new epistemology and that would be more the way of, of how reality is participatory. And their fictions are part of it. It's sort of, we co-create our reality and it's sort of more the way of intersubjective. That we share this reality and we co -const we construct it while, it while living it. And it's the same with media. And, you know, it's not necessarily fictions. It's sort of that it it's constantly shifts. And, you know, while I believe cognitive, cognitive sciences who always talk about mind and the brain and the split between the mind and the brain, they're running behind. Even in biology, where they had at least one revolution with Darwin, cognitive science are running behind and they always refer to matter where consciousness in the brain, the mind has, has actually, is actually an epiphenomenon, but it's maybe the opposite. Maybe it's more implicit and maybe consciousness is the ground, at least that's what quantum physics is able to prove as well through certain, uh, when they talk about entanglement and that the object and the subject observe and observed are entangled. And when you talk about fictions, you have to go down to the core of what matter stands for. And there, even there, on the, on, on, on the level of quantums, it becomes fiction. And, or not fiction, but sort of, it's, it's sort of in the moment of being defined and it's part of consciousness. And that's what we're dealing with. And, and it's sort of, I think it's part of the discussion as well. Within science, it's, it's, it's crucial. But maybe we're going into the trajectory that's sort of bordering on, on philosophy. But I think your question is so valid, and it's, it's definitely what this is all about. Is that a sufficient answer, or there's maybe some parts I left out? But I could show it's a, it's a diptych. It's, it's diptych where it's actually an anti-commercial, and then a, an anti-commercial that functions as a commercial, but then the parody of the commercial. So it's a commercial for Dove, but it's conceived as an anti-commercial, which ironically seems to sell even more.
So this is a Dove commercial that makes sort of the whole manipulation of beauty sort of transparent. But then there is... I have actually two parallels because I, I think it's crucial to, to show them uh, both together. So this is the parody. But for those who have seen it already, I brought a new one, which is the parody of the parody that has become a commercial. And you see how artists actually appropriate a commercial that has become a parody that has been appro appropriated by the advertising industry to, again to become a parody of a parody. So. Thank you very much.